entering part two now of the cosmology conflict. We're going to follow on some of the same lines and have a look at some of the later scientists uh, of the classical period and see, see if we can see similar tendencies in their beliefs and in their the things that they are famous for producing. You see on the slide there, Newton, Galileo, there's some of the people who we will be discussing. And I just want to bring back to the point of how we view this subject of the true nature of cosmology in the light of the great controversy. As we saw, Copernicus, uh, his theories were actually requested to be published by Pope Clement in the 16th century. And we saw that this was in response to the fact that the Bible was being circulated so abundantly that faith was being moved from the Catholic Church to, to the Word of God and that people were breaking free from the shackles of superstition and ignorance. And it was Rome's object to bring people back into superstition and ignorance, to destroy faith in the Bible that was exploding all over the world because of the Word. And how did they do it? We saw before from the confession of Cardinal Wolsey, the advisor to King Henry VIII, because printing could not be put down, because William Tyndale's writings were being circulated everywhere, they had to set up learning against learning and to introduce persons to dispute so that they could suspend the, the people between fear and controversy. They would bring learning that was in controversy against the Word of God. And what better thing to, to bring in than the nature of the earth? Because we know that the, the Bible is so abundantly clear on how the earth is. And the result, as we're going to see, was a total uh, reversal in the faith that was being brought in through the Reformation. So our subject is Galileo. We read in Wikipedia on the article about Galileo, he says, Galileo's championing of heliocentrism and Copernicanism was controversial during his lifetime. We all, I assume, learn in high school how the ignorant Christian church was against Galileo because because they believed that what the Bible said and the earth was flat and Galileo was saying that, you know, in reality, the earth revolved around the sun and, you know, the, the world is a globe and all these sorts of things. I don't know, does, does everyone remember that? I, I certainly was taught that. But as from what we've seen before, that wasn't really true because the Catholic Church uh, was, was actually, as we saw, behind Copernicus in the beginning. The Catholic Church actually requested that he publish his findings. So what they taught us at school is not really, not really the truth. It was not merely a science versus religion thing as they would have us to believe. Because, like as we said, the Catholic Church did not believe the earth was flat and they actually promoted the globe. And we saw that Rome actually pioneered the globe. So this doesn't really make sense, what they're saying, the, the controversy they sold us at school. We read that Rome banned Copernicus and arrested Galileo. In March 5th, 1516, Nicholas Copernicus's book on the revolution of the heavenly spheres was banned by the Catholic Church. And then following Galileo's trial by the Roman Inquisition, Copernicus's book was banned and remained off the list, on the list of prohibited books until 1835. So this doesn't really make sense. Why, why would the Catholic Church first... Uh, approve the globe, publish, publish findings on the globe, why would they put, make, make uh, write Bibles with the translation globe and um, celebrate the pagan philosopher that actually was the source of it all and then trial Galileo and ban Copernicus? Why would they do that? It's a fair question. But one thing we have to understand about the Catholic Church is, is this point. In the book of Daniel, talking about the papacy, it says, And through his policy also he shall cause craft to prosper in his hand, and he shall magnify himself in his heart, and by peace shall destroy many. He shall also stand against the prince of princes, but he shall be broken without hand. So he shall cause craft to prosper. That His policy shall be a policy of craft and deception. Uh, we know that the Jesuits were formed in the 16th century, so... The time of Galileo's uh, arrest in 1600s, the Jesuit order was, was in, full, um, in full motion. And we know that they have been the most deceitful and crafty organization that the earth has ever known. And by peace they destroy many. In the times of peace is when they ruined. We know that they infiltrated Protestantism, destroyed it. We know that they infiltrated the universities and the schools and turned 
like as, as we saw Martin Luther said, turn them into the great gates of hell. And that's how they, they destroyed many. They destroyed many eternally through all these false lying teachings like the globe and other heresies. I'm just going to read a quote from The Art of War by Sun Tzu, who was actually translated uh, by a Jesuit missionary called Father Amiot. So you might as well, you can, you can read these as the words of the Jesuits. And it really entails their modus operandi. And they say, all warfare is based on deception. Hence, when we are able to attack, we must seem unable. When using our forces, we must appear inactive. When we are near, we must make the enemy believe we are far away. And when far away, we must make him believe we are near. Appear weak when you are strong and strong when you are weak. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting. Now, these certainly is a very crafty illustration of how they operate. They, they make you, they use, they use their forces with, when they appear inactive. We know that the, the, the uh, Catholic Church disbanded the Jesuits and made it look like they were finished. But in reality, the Jesuits just went underground and then infiltrated even more than they were before. So the, that they, they do many things that make it a, to, throw, to throw you off, the, off their track. So what I'm, uh, what I'm saying here is that the attack on Galileo was really um, ca calculated to actually sell heliocentrism to the Protestants because we saw, we saw earlier that they were, they were firmly rejecting it in, in opposition to it because of what the Bible says. Now I'm going to play you a, a video by a Jesuit who actually confesses, basically confesses this fact. This man's name is um, Guy J. Consol Magno. He's an American researcher, astronomer, a Jesuit religious brother. This is, this is from Wikipedia, by the way. And director of the Vatican Observatory and president of the Vatican Observatory Foundation. So he's the Jesuit's uh, chief astronomer. The one thing that I do want to say about Galileo, three points. Galileo was a devout Catholic even after his trial. Galileo was actually never convicted of being a heretic. The conviction that when they said, we, we found you guilty of heresy, you, re, you can read the transcript of the trial. It's not what you think it is. It's Galileo saying, what did I do wrong? I'll change it, please. And they're saying, nope, sorry, we can't let you do that. Very odd. At the end, they said, so we found you guilty of heresy. It looks like they had written the, the verdict before the trial even began. And Galileo said, well, actually, you never did find me guilty of any heresy. So he was found guilty of vehement suspicion of heresy. <laughs> and the famous scene where he has to abjure his teachings, what he actually says is, and, and writes and signs, is I reject anything and everything in my writings which is contrary to the teachings of the church without ever specifying any of those things. I mean, he could have been a Jesuit, right? I mean, he could have been a Jesuit, right? We know that the, the heliocentric theory wasn't contrary to the church beliefs. They actually, they actually published it. But, and that Jesuit there admits the other connection with the Jesuits. I don't, I don't even actually know what the last word he says there is. It's just kind of funny the way he talks there, but there's, he's, he's admitting that he was never tried as a heretic, that, it, that it's, um, he never actually went against the church, and he actually didn't, well, he was tried as a heretic, he wasn't convicted of heresy. So it's a pretty strange situation that um, you see here. Um, and there's certainly, a, he, he, he hints at a connection with the Jesuits there. And look what else he says. He says, nobody knows really why Galileo was gone after. For most of Galileo's life, he was lionized. He was treated as a hero, including by people in the church. When Galileo got into trouble at the end of his life, it was a real shock. It was a complete reversal of everything that he had said up to that point. Remember, he was a devout Catholic before and after. So it just something happened where he just, he just, it just went on trial all of a sudden. Seems strange. Anyway, continues. And so the historical question is, why did it happen? And the answer is, we don't know. He gets some clues, though. 
You can go to amazon.com and find 300 books on Galileo, every one of them with a different answer, which is to say there was something going on and it wasn't simply a science versus religious thing like they want to, say, like they want to tell us. And now he hints at a conspiracy. If you relied on JFK, the movie, to figure out what happened in the assassination of Kennedy, you'd be in as good shape. No, so he's saying the JFK movie is probably accurate. The JFK movie, by the way, talks, it, it, it shows that the assassination of Kennedy was a conspiracy. And he says, you've got to remember that the Galileo affair occurred at the height of the Reformation in the 30 years war. So he's saying there was something going on. He likens it to the JFK assassination, which, which I think is almost everyone believes is a conspiracy. There's something, there's more to it. And it had something to do with the Reformation and the 30 years war, which was, which was a war between Catholic and Protestant uh, nations at the time. So this supports my hypothesis that this is just another facet of the counter-reformation in order to uh, destroy the faith in the, in the Bible. It's another attack on the reformation. And the reason you can uh, rationalize from it is people, people um, empathize with, with, with others that are undergoing the same thing. So by persecuting Galileo, that would have warmed the Protestants to him that would have sold his theories to them because oh look the, the, the protestants all knew that the pope was the antichrist and everything he does is bad so therefore if the pope it's sort of a bit of reverse psychology if the if the papacy persecutes galileo then he must be having have some truth right and we actually see after that point that the, the heliocentric model start to be more and more accepted and and even today this this, this galileo argument is still being used about how ignorant people are that want to stick with the Bible. You know, this is just a, a psyop from the 16th century, 17th century. And it's been very effective. <clears throat> and you've got to remember in 1563, the Jesuit, after that, the Jesuits were in full operation. Okay. So let's have a little, little look at Galileo and see what, he, what his practices were. Again, we saw what the Protestants believed. The Protestants were against this. The Protestants' were, motto was sola scriptura. But Galileo, we saw, was a devout Catholic before and after. And also he was an astrologer. We read here, It seems to me impossible to have the slightest doubt that Galileo was involved in, with astrology. Indeed, that he was famous for his great ability in the arts, so that distinguished people consulted him with complete confidence, in many cases asking for horoscopes and predictions. We can see Galileo was involved in astrology. Another, this is actually a, a quote from him. So who does not know that clemency, kindness of heart, gentleness of manners, splendor and royal blood and nobleness, etc., emanate from the most benign star of Jupiter? See, the, I don't know if, if any of you are familiar with astrology. It's got to do with where the sun was when you were born. Anyway, astrology is spoken of in the Bible quite a lot. For example, in Daniel chapter 2, when the king has his dream, King Nebuchadnezzar, then he, the King Nebuchadnezzar, commanded all the magicians and the astrologers and the sorcerers and the Chaldeans for to show the king his dreams. So they came and stood before the king. So immediately we see a connection. Astrology comes from Babylon, just like heliocentrism and all the rest of the sun worship. Astrology is just a, another facet of Babylonian sun worship. And we know even King Nebuchadnezzar saw through these guys. He, he commanded them to be cut in pieces. He, he um, recognized that they were frauds and deceivers. Just like we should today with, with um, these other astrologers that we're reading about. Here's another scripture about it. Isaiah 47, 13. It's actually talking about people that trust in, in these things. Thou art wearied in the multitude of thy counsels. Let now the astrologers, the stargazers, and the monthly prognosticators stand up and save thee from the things that shall come upon thee. See, God condemns trust in astrologers. But really, when, when you subscribe to the scientific uh, version of the universe, according to these guys, you, you're actually following the words of astrologers and sorcerers. We're going to see a little bit more of that later. And another confession of a Jesuit we're going to see, to see how identified they have been with science, throughout the classical period is, he says this, it is a challenge for historians to find a single significant scientist of the 16th, 17th and 18th centuries who was not in some way involved with the Jesuits and their colleagues. 
as students, teachers, relatives, collaborators, or as adversaries, or rivals, or simply as personal friends. This is from a Jesuit historian. So not a single, it's, it's a struggle to find a single significant scientist. And that's true, that's a fact. I'm gonna show that, show that now. There's another one, a uh, man called Johannes Kepler. People that know astronomy will, will, will be aware of him. This is from Wikipedia. Johannes Kepler was a German astronomer, mathematician, and astrologer. So he was another astrologer. All these guys were into sorcery. He is a key figure in the 17th century scientific revolution. Best known for his laws of planetary motion, these works also provided one of the foundations for Newton's theory of universal gravitation. Okay, so we have, you see Kepler was involved in astrology. And more from Wikipedia, some of his findings. In 1609, Johannes Kepler correctly suggested, they, they believe, that the gravitation of the moon causes the tides. Incidentally, Galileo believed it was the rotation of the earth that causes the tides. And science today has, de has decided that Kepler is um, behind that. Uh, it was correct in the argument. I think they're both wrong. Uh, NASA says that uh, his third law he published in 1619, it was this law, not an apple, that led Newton to his law of gravitation. Kepler can be truly called the founder of celestial mechanics. So he's a revered figure in the scientific revolution, they call it. Now let's establish this 17th century scientist's connection with the Jesuits. This is an excerpt from a letter that was written by Kepler, and he said that to the very Reverend Father Paul Goulden, priest of the Society of Jesus. So it's a letter to a Jesuit. He calls him venerable and learned man, beloved patron. There is hardly anyone at this time with whom I would rather discuss matters of astronomy than with you. So we can see that he was discussing astronomy with a Jesuit. And now he disclosed some information that Father Zucci could not have entrusted this most remarkable gift. I speak of the telescope. So the Jesuits have, have gifted this scientist who was struggling financially with a telescope. Now, we know the Jesuits don't just give gifts out of the goodness of their hearts. They are a military order that was set up to destroy Protestantism through deceit and craft. So, obviously, they were buying the allegiance of this man by telescope, which is actually a very expensive item at that time. They were only recently been uh, made into anything useful. So we can see here that connection there that they were discussing matters and, and actually supplying him with the tools needed for his supposedly scientific um, assertions that he, he gave. So there's some telling information there. But we're going to see again that he's another one who's deeply into this occult philosophy, another hermeticist. I mean, this, is, this is from his own writings. Like, now, now, when you read this, again, I, I want to emphasize how esoteric and uh, immaterial and occult the, the, the things these people were into were. They weren't, they weren't the straight-laced, uh, objective, scientific men that science wants to tell you they are. And they, and they hide these things from you. But take a look at this. This is from his book, Harmony of the World. He says, A very few days after the pure sun of that most wonderful study began to shine, nothing restrains me. It is my pleasure to yield to the inspired frenzy. It is my pleasure to taunt mortal men with the candid acknowledgement that I am stealing the golden vessels of the Egyptians to build a tabernacle to my God from them. Far, far away from the boundaries of Egypt, I cast the die, I write the book. You see what, what he's saying here? He's saying, again, like we saw with Copernicus, this, these are the writings of a heathen philosopher, not a scientist. He says there that, He's taunting mortal men. Is that a good thing? Is that a Christian thing? With the candid acknowledgement that I'm stealing the golden vessels of the Egyptians to build a tabernacle to my God from them. He's, he's acknowledging that he got his ideas from Egypt, from Hermes Trismegistus, just like the rest of them. And as we saw before, Her Hermes Trismegistus said, around the sun are the six spheres that depend from it and the sphere of the fixed stars, the sphere of the planets and the one that surrounds the earth. Uh, Kepler believed in the, this, this celestial sphere theory, like Copernicus. He actually created this model here, you see. That's uh, a mod his model of the universe, which, which is just what's described in, um, in Hermes' thing there. It's straight out of the Hermetica. So we can see another one they like to revere as a scientist is just another 
hermeticist. And now we come to uh, Isaac Newton. Now, if you uh, remember before, five men had given a new divine revelation to the world. This is Andrew Dixon's book. And through the last Newton had come vast new conception destined to be fatal to the old theory of creation. So Newton was a big player in this, Isaac Newton. Uh, he, this, this historian signifies him as, as, as a standout. And we're going to show, I'm going to show what his, his most famous uh, declaration was. And show how fundamental, how important and significant it is. Without his contribution, the whole thing falls apart. What it is, is Newton, his physics underpinned the whole heliocentric model, his universe. No doubt he was a genius, but he was also a wizard, as we're going to say. And the Bible says this, Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Now, whatever he came up with, the theories, the, 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 the fact that he was into the occult, and that he was, uh, as the Bible terms, a wizard, it should cast a lot of doubt on everything that he came up with, the things I'm going to share with you. Now, let's see what some of his discoveries were. Isaac Newton, Sir Isaac Newton, he was knighted by the Queen, contributed significantly to the field of science over his lifetime. He invented calculus and provided a clear understanding of optics, but his most significant work had to do with forces and specifically with the development of a universal law of gravity. So the law of gravity is his, his contribution. It's from space.com. And we've heard this story at school, I, I remember I did. The popular myth tells of an apple falling from a tree in his garden, which brought Newton to an understanding of forces, particularly gravity. Whether the incident actually happened is unknown, but historians doubt the event, if it occurred, was the driving force in Newton's thought processes. Have you, did you all hear that story in school? I think that's one of the ones they want to brainwash with us with, no? Anyway, I've got, I've got an interesting account of that in a second I'll share that. His most famous work came with the publication of his Philosophie Naturalis Principia Mathematica, generally called Principia. In it, he determined the three laws of motion for the universe. From all of this, Newton calculated the universal law of gravity, which is Newton's law of universal gravitation states that every mass attracts every other mass in the universe. This, so this is, what, this is Newton's most famous contribution. That mass, all mass attracts every other mass. And this is what underpins the heliocentric universe. Okay. Orbits, satellites, moon, the moon landing, the Big Bang theory, black holes, all of these things. Without this theory of universal gravitation, they, they all fall down. They're all, they're all finished. What is that theory? Go a little bit more detail. Gravitation, as we saw, is that all mass attracts every other mass in the universe. And it attracts them by these invisible things called gravitons. Graviton is thought to be the carrier of the gravitational field. Gravitons, like photons, would be massless, electrically charged particles traveling at the speed of light. Gravitons have not been directly observed. Okay, so gravity is, is supposed to exist because these invisible things called gravitons are attracting all mass towards each other. And larger masses, like the sun, obviously have more gravitons and they attract things toward it, causing everything to orbit around and all these sorts of things. So they admit they've never been directly observed according to Cyclopedia Britannica. We're not talking about the fact that if I drop this, it would fall to the ground. Everyone knows that. You, you learn that when, you're, when you first learn to work, walk, that if, that, that if you stand up and you slip, you fall down. That's, you don't have to have an apple fall on your head to figure that out. Uh, and you don't need to come up with gravitons to, to, to learn that. So while I cannot, I cannot directly disprove the theory of gravity, but what I can prove is that Isaac Newton was a sorcerer and he was into hermeticism and that these ideas came directly from that, which should make this whole theory fall over in the mind of any Christian who wants to believe the Bible and obey the counsel we saw here to re not to regard them that uh, to seek after wizards. Just on a side note, this is why things fall to the ground. It's got to do with density. We see the bolt at the bottom, honey, corn syrup, and right on the top, the ping pong ball and the oil, everything, things that are denser go down. 
the air is a fluid, water is a fluid, but air is actually a fluid too, because you breathe it in and out. You're actually breathing something in and out, right? So a, he a helium balloon goes up, why? Because the gas inside is less dense than the gas on the outside. A hot air balloon goes up because the air inside is less dense than the cooler air on the outside. That's as simple as that. You know, we don't have to invent invisible gravitons to, to discover these things. You can, you can see, you can, this is something that is actually provable by the common person. You can't, these gravitons have never been observed. They're just a fiction of people's imagination that comes out of um, the mind of a person who was heavily involved in the occult. So, and like I said before, the theory of gravity says these laws help scientists understand more about the motions of the planets in the solar system and of the moon around the sun. So without this, the motions in the solar system are, are not scientific, scientific. They have to have, the, 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 they have to be able to be falling towards the sun in order for an orbit to exist. And for, in order for satellites to, to be up there, they have to be, it has to be gravity pulling them towards the earth and somehow falling and going, going sideways at the same time anyway. Gravity needs to exist for all these things to, to, to be provable, to be in the you know, theory of space and heliocentrism. So, like I said, I can't, I can't say, I can't disprove gravity, but I, I, no one can prove it either. But what I can prove is that Isaac Newton was a sorcerer. This is from Holly Rebeek of NASA, and she says that Isaac Newton put the final nail in the coffin for the geocentric view of the universe. We know that the, that the Bible presents a geocentric view of the universe. Newton explained why the planets moved as they did around the sun, and he gave the force that kept them in check a name, gravity. So up to Newton, according to Holly Rebeek, the argument wasn't settled. So obviously this theory of gravity was the, the settling argument, according to historians, that forever put to bed the geocentric view of the universe. So we can see the, the large role that Newton's theory of gravity has to play in this. And we know that one error always leads to another, which brings us on to our next point. The theory of gravity underp underpins the Big Bang. As we read in the Financial Times, an article on the Big Bang, it says, as the universe expanded and cooled, according to the model, gravity pulled matter together to form stars and galaxies. So you need gravity in order for the Big Bang to work, to explode and then all this exploded gas and things to form into stars and planets. So you can see how, how all these errors are built upon each other and they all go back to the globe and the, helis and the spinning globe around the sun. It's just been from, from deception to deception. Okay, Isaac Newton, for one thing, was a Freemason. Uh, this is a book uh, written by a man. I'm not gonna quote from this book, but uh, this is just a historical fact. And th th it's true that there were some people that were, that were Freemasons that weren't bad. But he was, and it says there, the alchemy of science and mysticism. He was an alchemist. Some people might say, well, Isaac Newton was a, was a Protestant. And he, he wasn't a Catholic, that's for, for certain. And he, and he believed some true things. We know he um, identified the Pope as the Antichrist. I, I, I've actually used that before in a, in a study I've done. And it, it's, true, it's true what he says. But Freemasonry was created by the Jesuits as a to attract those dissenters from Catholicism. It was created in Protestant countries and its purpose was to, to gather together dissenters against the church and then the leading people of the country and then to lead those same people into the same, uh, to, to, what's the word? Initiate them in the same mysteries that the, Catholic, that the Jesuits were into. It's, it's like a, it was like a second Jesuit sort of thing. They, they invented it to, um, create another sort of Protestant version of the Jesuits. And once initiated into the mysteries to turn them into agents of Satan to further their plans on different platforms. So there we, we see that the alchemy of science and mysticism. What is alchemy? According to the Oxford English Dictionary, alchemia, which is derived from the ancient Egyptian name of Egypt, chem, uh, meaning blackness. Therefore, alchemy is the black art. So alchemy goes back to Egypt. The main sort of famous thing alchemy is for is turning lead into gold. That was what alchemists were doing. They were searching for the philosopher's stone, which was something that enabled them to turn lead into gold. It's all just uh, hocus pocus, really. But Isaac Newton was into it. And it's another interesting connection with Egypt here. Take notice of. 
Now, while Newton was a scientist and he wrote a lot about science, he wrote more about, about alchemy than he did about science. You see here, Newton wrote more than one million words about alchemy throughout his life in the hope of using ancient knowledge to better explain the nature of matter. Notice this is from National Geographic. This is mainstream source. And possibly strike it rich. But academics have long tiptoed around this connection since alchemy is usually dismissed as mystical pseudoscience full of fanciful discredited processes. So they want to separate the, the alchemy from Newton's real science, which was really, in fact, just alchemy. It was all science. They want to, they want to say, this is, this, is, this is alchemy, this is science, but it's actually all alchemy. So much so, science has tried to sanitize Isaac Newton's image throughout the years. Christian and, and atheists alike, because they don't, want to, they don't want to connect him with this because it discredits their entire um, foundation of how the universe works. Most of his writings were, were declared not fit to be printed after his death. And we read here, before his death in 1727, Newton wrote a letter to fellow alchemist Robert Boyle urging him to keep high silence about his alchemy. Even Newton knew that if this got out, he would be discredited, especially because that was in a very Christian time. And he was in a Protestant country. If he was found out to be involved in this stuff, there'd be, there'd be big trouble. In his book by B.J. Dobbs, The Foundation of Newton's Alchemy, the author quotes from a letter from Newton. Because of the way by which the mercurial principle, this is very cryptic, by the way, the mercurial principle may be impregnated, has been thought fit to be concealed by others that have known it, other alchemists, and therefore may possibly be an inlet to something more noble than that is not to be communicated without immense damage to the world if there be any verity in the warning of the hermetic writers there are other things besides the transmutation of metals which none but they understand i know that's a whole lot of confusing nonsense but it proves that he was he was right into this alchemy stuff and he, he, he wanted to hide it from the public. That's, what, that's the point that I get from this. And he's also, there was a book written called The Last Sorcerer about Isaac Newton. In 1936, 1936, a collection of Newton's papers was purchased by Sotheby's by the respected economist and Newton scholar John Maynard Keynes. Keynes then studied these papers, so, so a lot of his papers that have been hidden for a long time. Keynes then studied these papers and no doubt relishing their historical import. Afterwards, he gave a lecture to the Royal Society in which he declared, now this is interesting. So this guy Keynes gets these papers that no one had seen of Newton's, studies them, and this is a conclusion he comes to. Newton was not the first of the age of reason like science wants you to think. He was a logical, objective man who just came up with these laws of physics. He was the last of the magicians, the last of the Babylonians and Sumerians, the last wonder child whom the Magi could do sincere and appropriate homage. See, even this, now I don't know who this man was, this author, but he connects him with Babylon and Sumerians. He was a Magi. He was, he was a, 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 a wizard. Of, what does it say there? Magician. You know, and they didn't teach us this stuff in high school. Another thing about Newton. Newton as we saw, was very much into the uh, Hermetic writings. And one thing he translated is called the Emerald Tablet. Uh, and if you look in this thing, you see, you actually see hints of where he got his theory of gravity from. Now, we're reading all these sort of satanic things, but we have to see where these people came from. And this is Newton's translation of the Emerald Tablet, which is a, which is a text that was, was supposedly written by Hermes Trismegistus, the guy that we've been, we've been reading about. And Newton translates this tablet, which says, It is true without lying, certain and most true, that which is below is like that which is above. I don't know anyone involved with the, anyone who knows about the occult can recognize those words. That's, that's, the, that's the chief saying of Satanists. Uh, that's the, that's the symbol of, on the symbol of Baphomet, as above, so below. Okay. Its force is above all force, for it vanquishes every subtle thing and penetrates every solid thing. So he's talking about a force that, and that has something to do with solid matter, mass. Can you see the, Can you see perhaps a theory of gravity in there? Hence, I am called Hermes Trismegistus, having the three parts of the philosophy and the whole world, etc. 
Uh, the operation of the sun is accomplished and ended in. So he mentions three parts. Newton has three laws of motion. See, all these things come straight from this heathen philosophy. And, you know, the Bible says this in Isaiah chapter 8. And when they shall say unto you, Seek un unto them that have familiar spirits, and unto wizards that peep and, mut and that mutter, should not a people seek unto their God for the living unto the dead? We have this warning against, against sorcery. And as I began with in the beginning, the arguments people come up with against the flat earth are all out of science because they got nothing from the Bible. And this, this science is based on the findings of these wizards and sorcerers like Isaac Newton, like the astrologer Galileo, uh, Copernicus, the Catholic cleric who was also a hermeticist. Um, and it's, it's amazing the way people redirect uh, the, the, the proof that you give them from Scripture. They redirect it straight to science. Oh, what about the theory of gravity? What about satellites? What about this? What about that? All these things are based on these uh, wizards that we're told to not to seek after. But what does the Bible say? To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. We shouldn't be seeking them. We should be seeking what the Word says. And it comes, that's what it's got to come back to. When, 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 when someone shows you good Bible evidence for a flat earth with the sun rotating above it and affirmment, don't come back with objections from, from wizards like this. To the law and to the testimony, we're supposed to be the, the, the people of God. And it's not gravity that holds earth. In its orbit. This is what science tells us. Gravity holds Earth in an orbit around the sun. It's holding us in place. What does the Bible say? Job 26, verse 7. He stretches out the north over the empty place and hangeth the earth upon nothing. Some heliocentrists like to quote this and say, Oh, you know, see, look, the earth's hanging in space on nothing. But according to according to them, it's not hanging on nothing, it's actually held by the, the sun's gravity around the sun. Oh, Albert Barnes even denies that this is talking about the globe. But what God is, is trying to, uh, what Job is trying to express here is the same thought that David expressed, I'll show you in a second, that is God's power that holds the earth, that it holds it upon nothing of any stability. As we read in the Psalm uh, 24, David says, The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. For he hath founded it upon the seas and established it upon the floods. According to the Bible, according to Genesis chapter 1, according to David in here in Psalm 24, the, the world is, is, is founded upon the seas and established upon the floods. It's sitting on water. It's not hanging about in space in some uh, infinite universe orbiting around the sun. NASA wants to tell you gravity is very important to us. We could not live on earth without it. The sun's gravity keeps earth in orbit around it. But the Bible says that, that God founded it upon the seas and established it on the floods. So ultimately, this controversy, it's about the, 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 wisdom of, the wisdom of man versus the wisdom of God. It's whether you believe the, the, you believe the findings of, of sorcerers, wizards, the paper mutter, or the, or the truth of God's word that, that we saw, the, the reformers, the, the Jews, and even all the way back to, to Moses, believed in, they believed the earth was an extensive flat plain surrounded by seas, covered by a crystalline from as we saw. And so really this is just a, as we saw, it's just another, uh, this heliocentric globe is just another part of the counter-reformation that has been employed to uh, destroy faith in the Bible. That it was, and we saw that it was, it was conceived of in the time of the very height of the Reformation when Martin Luther and, and, and William Tyndale were fighting for the faith. And, it, and, and has it been successful in destroying faith in the Bible? Absolutely. This, has been, this, is, the, this is the most uh, successful deception the devil's ever had. And that's why there's such animosity against it. We read here the last quote here by Alex Gleason in his book, Is the Bible from Heaven and the Earth a Glow? This man was an Adventist. He says, And lastly, Newton loses his reasoning powers, in short, becomes insane. And his contemporary friends admit this to be true. And what is more, the Christian world is yet to ascertain which has produced the greatest amount of unbelief in God and his word. Tom Paine, 
Hume and Voltaire? Or the advocates of the Copernican theory of astronomy? So which, which has produced more unbelief? The theory of astronomy. Who, who, who has read Thomas Paine's words? No, no, we haven't read that. I'm sure we've, we've, we know people that have been influenced by it. But who has heard of the, the Copernican theory of astronomy? I'm sure all of us, all of us believe that, right? Everyone. So, and the, the Copernican th- theory of astronomy makes the Bible look stupid. It does. If you believe that, you've got to reject the Bible. You have to. When you, once you look at it, before you've, before you've, you've seen it, you've got, to, you've got to dismiss the verses as poetic or that the Hebrews had a misconception. They, you know, these are the conclusions you have to come to, which are, which are both false. So this is a big deal. And um, ultimately, it's just part of the, um, the, the message of the faith that was once delivered unto the saints, that we, that we desire to go forward with. We desire to continue the Reformation and stand with the Reformers uh, on our belief in what God really created. I invite you to kneel with me and as we close with prayer. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you that we haven't been left in darkness, that we don't need to doubt about um, what you created in those six days. We thank you that you made it as, it as you did, and we rejoice that we now have a knowledge of that truth, and we know that uh, you are not far away as the heliocentric model likes to tell us that you are thousands of light years away, but we know that, as Ezekiel said in chapter 1, you are just above that crystalline firmament watching over us, and we thank you for that knowledge, and we just pray that you'll keep us, Lord, for the rest of this Sabbath and, and for the rest of the time until, until you return, we pray, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>